Sit up straight, eyes on me. I'm Petty Officer Sperry. I will be your lead RDC. Petty Officer 10 will be your second RDC. Petty Officer Gonzalez will be your third RDC. Together, we have eight weeks to transform you and the United States sailors. You are no longer a civilian. Whatever you were before is now over. You are about to begin a journey that's gonna make you a part of the greatest naval force the world has ever known. This training will not be easy. It wasn't meant to be. You will not be coddled nor disrespected, but you will be held to a high standard. Our job as your RDCs is to turn you into basically trained sailors. Your job as recruits is to do what you're taught and give us 100% motivation. You'll all be treated the same, no matter your sex, cultural background, religion, or sexual orientation. There are no individuals in the military. We are many, but we operate as one unit. For this team to be successful, you have to work together. If you fail, the team fails. Get on your feet. Get up. Let's go. Get up. Get up. Get up. My name is Petty Officer Sperry. I'm a recruit division commander at Recruit Training Command. All divisions start off basically the same. They're, they're very scared. They don't know what, what they're supposed to expect 49. during their eight week training. 51. Turn your head. It's easy. Say your number. 51. 52. 53. No. Pay attention. Stop. Stop. Pay attention to what you're Turn your head and say your number. 59. 60. 61. Pay your number. 63. Pay Wait attention. for the person in front of you to turn their freaking head so you can say your number and then you go after them. Do you I'm Chief Petty Officer Stigall. I'm a recruit division commander here at Recruit Training Command Great Lakes. Processing days, that's where you're issued on your, your initial issue, Diddy issue. They have their basic medical indoctrination, but they get a series of shots. So during that week, you get a lot of shots. You get kind of everything you need to continue the rest of your training. The shots were, were not fun. We got dental work done, which we just finished today. It was long, a long, long process. Everything that you do is with a purpose, and you do it to the best of your ability. We want to give them a shock, and we let them know that, you know, you haven't even started training yet. You haven't even begun to experience exactly what we're about to subject you to. And then you start teaching them the very basics, how to stand at attention, how to salute, how to do facing movements, left face, right face, about face. Learning how to fold things, learning how to do things correctly. I gave you 15 minutes to shave and brush your teeth. We are going on 25 minutes. This is unset. Let's go! The first few days of boot camp, that's when recruits don't really know what to expect. So when you start yelling at them... You understand? Yes, Petty You're here to get better, not to stand freaking lazy. You understand? Yes, Petty Officer. And don't stand like that. I shouldn't be repeating myself when I already trained... Some people really have a negative effect to that, and they don't like being talked to like that. And then some of them understand the process and understand that that's us being on them 100% all the time is what's going to make them a better sailor in the end. You know, I don't, uh, everything they do, I don't take it personal because I realize they are training me to be a sailor. It's a lot of tough love um, and it's like I know that they want us to succeed again. I know that they want us to do well. You know, they've all been through this themselves. Um, they have gone through a lot of training themselves to be RDCs. So trying to just remember that and give them that equal amount of respect um, really helps me get through it. They've been, they've been good. Like they'll, they only really, um, again, if you're doing the right thing, they're not going to be yelling at you. 55, 56, 57, 58, 59. Then why are you here? Two, two, three, zero. Get across the freaking hall. All right. We have to yell at them a lot and get them to understand that we need them not just to react to what we're saying, but to react fast. We're going to make it uncomfortable for them. We're going to make it so that they are able to, one, have confidence in themselves and their abilities, um, but also be able to deal with the stress. 
And so that's why we create a stressful environment. That's why we keep the temp up. What did your RDCs tell you about failure? If you fail, who fails? The whole team. Your initial PFA is tomorrow. You need to understand that if you fail, you will get set back. So tomorrow's gonna be a reality check for the recruits. It's gonna be their baseline uh, PFA where they're gonna be required to run a mile and a half, do a number amount of sit-ups and push-ups. Some won't make it, so someone's gonna go home. Ugh, I wanted to pass out and just die. <laughs> like, give me a gallon of water, let me drink it. So we were all really stressed about um, who was gonna pass and who wasn't gonna pass. Let's go, Jones. Let's go. Get up there. Come on. Don't think about it. Let's go. Come on. Five more. Five more. Give me five more. I happily that I didn't. I was able to pass it. I'm glad. So hopefully I can pass the next one with a better score. With the PFA, um, I knew I was ready. I was ready for it before coming to boot camp. But the day before, I got really, really sick. Still, I felt sick during the PFA, but I just pushed because I didn't want to get separated. And so that PFA baseline is just that, it's the baseline. It's not even the actual PFA standard. Right? And if they can't meet the baseline, then they probably need to go find something else to do. I don't give a crap if you're tired, if you think the sea bag too heavy, you came here to serve, so own up and do it. Week one of the actual boot camp, they can expect to be staying up late, long hours, working at a fast pace. They're gonna be expected to pass their swim qualification and expected to march as a unit. And those are all things that we're training them from the beginning in P-Days. They're gonna have to bring it together week one and make sure they're performing all those tasks. So in P-Days, we, we are loud and we are aggressive with them, but we are instructors at first. We teach, we're teaching them everything and we take our time. Because come week one, then it's not, we don't have time to train every little thing over and over again. They need to learn it. So when we're telling them at first they need to pick stuff up and this is how it has to be done, come week one, we expect that to happen so when they start failing during week one, then they're actually held accountable for their actions. Anything that you were before you came here, you wait goodbye to that. That's gone. Because as long as people in this world want to take your life because of where you live, because of where you breathe, you must be ready. And if you're not ready, we don't need you. Hurricane Irma, one year later, culture of preparedness. 
Irma was first identified as a potential threat on August 27, 2017. Irma made landfall on September 10. FEMA had staff in place before landfall. At our peak, more than 3,000 federal workers from nearly 40 agencies deployed to assist survivors. Twenty-two disaster recovery centers helped survivors. More than 775,000 households were approved for FEMA assistance. The whole community response depends on volunteers, nonprofits, and faith based groups drawing on their unique skills and capabilities. Florida Baptist Disaster Relief, 30,000 meals per day. American Red Cross delivered food to impacted neighborhoods. AmeriCorps cleared brush and fallen vegetation. Conk Republic Marine Army cleared debris from waterways. Fisherman's Community Hospital. Despite hurricane damages, the hospital continues to serve the community. St. Columba Episcopal Church purchased trailers to house local survivors on church property. Habitat for Humanity and Tourism Cares, repairing damages to homes of survivors. Florida adopted some of the nation's strongest building codes after Hurricane Andrew struck in 1992. Houses built after those stronger codes were enacted came through Irma with minimal damage. Mitigation best practice, elevating your home. St. Peter Catholic Church, installing impact resistant glass. Three of their four church buildings were destroyed. The one surviving building was built to current building codes. The Turtle Hospital learned from past storms and mitigated to prevent loss of life and property. The National Flood Insurance Program paid $964 million in flood claims. The average closed claim with payment $52,000. U.S. Small Business Administration, home loans approved, $1.1 billion. Public assistance, $209 million approved federal share. FEMA will continue to work in partnership with the state to address housing needs, public assistance projects for community recovery and infrastructure repair, and hazard mitigation to provide funding to build back stronger. concept reduces the drag at transonic speeds, allows the airplane to fly faster and farther. We've actually done aeronautics research for over a hundred years. So NASA's predecessor was the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the NACA field laboratories, and became part of NASA, and we've continued that tradition. They developed a lot of the theories for the people they had back there. They developed wind tunnels. We ran the wind tunnels actually three shifts a day because there was that much demand for the data from the companies and that's who we were doing it for. We had uh, lady computers who reduced the data for us. Ready to launch now. The X-15 was in many ways the ultimate research tool. The, the, the very first aircraft to fly into space and come back and land horizontally on a runway. We had to make the engine run in order to make the plane fly. It had to be dropped from altitude, it had to be started at altitude, and it had to have stable combustion. And we made it work. It was very much uh, an experimental, one-of-a-kind laboratory in the sky to investigate the next great hurdle, which was hypersonics. 
And that's a problem we're still working on today. So we've always been trying to go farther, faster, higher. That's what mankind has always wanted to do, to explore. That's what NASA does, we explore. And now NASA is looking at a new X-plane so that we can make it a little bit easier to get across the country about twice as fast. And the innovation there is actually the shape of the aircraft so that we can enable supersonic flight over land and that'll open up a whole new industry. Here we are looking at how do we take all of those things that we've learned historically and place them in an aircraft that can actually fly faster than the speed of sound without creating the sonic boom. And if we can accomplish that objective, then people all across the United States and in fact all across the world will be able to fly faster than the speed of sound. And in fact, they could fly multiple times the speed of sound without disrupting communities on the ground. We want to be at the very leading edge of technology when it comes to supersonic flight. When you look out that window and you see that winglet, that was developed originally by NASA. There's so many things that NASA has done that we're with you when you fly. The computers used on the space shuttle, the prototype of those computers were actually flown on the F-8 digital fly-by-wire airplane. Eighty percent of the world's commercial airliner fleet today use that same technology in order to fly their aircraft and almost all the military aircraft that are made today. I remember the first time I was flying an F-18 Hornet, I was in a bit of turbulence, and I thought I was holding the airplane steady, and my flight controls were moving. Well, those technologies and those capabilities were developed by NASA. Electric propulsion uh, is really just opens up the playing field for what you can do with airplanes. Vehicles that be an air taxi type vehicle where two or three, four people would travel across a downtown area and be able to get to a destination much quicker than being stuck on the freeway. And so it's going to create all new types of designs for vertical lift, transitioning to forward flight. And the predictions are that we'll get, we'll be three times more efficient. Unmanned aircraft systems follows in a long line of technologies that NASA always is pursuing to improve the quality of life for your everyday person. Like the examine bridges or buildings that perhaps were damaged in an earthquake. Find out where the damage is. Could do that by never having to actually go into the building or walk on the bridge. So that makes it safer for people. The RGP straight That's 836 registered. For 60 years we've been exploring. We stand on the shoulders of giants that came before us. They figured it out and we take it a little bit farther, a little bit farther. It's what we call pushing the envelope when you're a test pilot. After the assassination of President Lincoln, there was a massive effort to you know, hunt down John Wilkes Booth. A lot of people don't realize that that took place over a course of a few weeks in April 1865. What they were really concerned with at the time was Wilkes crossing the Potomac River from Maryland back into Virginia. So what they did was they had ships perform picket duty along the Potomac River to make sure that he would not have successful crossing. On the night of April 23rd, uh, one of the ships left Alexandria called the Black Diamond and it was a civilian ship employed by the quartermaster uh, of the army. And they went down the Potomac performing picket duty when they collided with a transport ship called the Massachusetts, who was transporting about 400 prisoner of wars at the time. Uh, when the two ships collided, both ships sank and it resulted in the deaths of 87 different people. There were four civilians off of the Black Diamond that were you know, employed by the quartermaster corps and when their bodies were finally discovered, the decision was made to bury them here at Alexandria National Cemetery. At the time, when you think about when they were interred here, it was still Soldier Cemetery. It wasn't officially Alexandria National Cemetery. They were, you know, they were buried alongside those who had died in the Civil War, uh, along active duty soldiers, because they perished during a time of war, and the decision was made that they should receive the same kind of honors since they were 
at the time serving their country. Shortly after they were interred here, in November of 1865, a memorial was placed for those four civilians. Over time, the condition of that memorial deteriorated, and in 1922, the U.S. government chose to replace it, and that is the one that's still here today. The massive event of John Wilkes Booth finally being you know, killed uh, while he was trying to be apprehended, that obviously dominated the news at the time for weeks, and so the story about what happened and the Potomac River was just so overshadowed by it that it kind of got lost. The NCA has many efforts, one of, one of which uh, the program I'm part of, the Veterans Legacy Program, we're encouraging students, uh, K through 12 and universities, to go out to these cemeteries to discover these veterans that are buried here and do genealogical research, discover who they were, not just in their service, but before and after, who they were in life, and then create something on that. Anytime we, we talk about these people again, it's almost like we're bringing them back to life. We're honoring them, you know, not just their service, but their life. And they're not just, you know, names on grave markers. Learning what they did, is that's how you honor them and that's how you keep them alive today. Uh, family service history, my, um, I guess it would start with my, my grandmother on my father's side. She um, served for the Foreign Service and then it, it trickled down to my father. He wanted to give back to a country that did so much for him, gave him so much opportunity. So he joined the, the Navy. He worked from the bottom all the way up um, from an E-1, you know, nothing to a, a Chief Warrant Officer 4. My brother Marco Kalkbrenner, he joined and my father enlisted him. And then um, <clears throat> while he, my brother was still in, I decided to enlist and uh, serve as well and uh, enlisted through Fort Meade. I got a phone call. Uh, they're like, hey, you know, we got a spot open. Do you want to go? It's going to leave in like two or three days. And I said, sure. And I was like, but I mean, I'm not going to do it unless my father can enlist me. And they said, all right, well, can you get up here? I gave my dad a call. He's like, yeah, I'm packing my bags. I'm on my way, you know, and just dropped everything, took off from work, drove up, and, uh, and he swore me in. But it made me proud to see my brother, Yvonne, do the same thing, and especially for him to be in my career field, the career field that I was in for 20 years. It was amazing. My brother joining the military and following my footsteps, following my dad's footsteps in a way. It's just the Kalkbrenner thing to do now, you know. When you see my dad and you hear my dad talk, you know that he had Navy running through his veins. So it was just being in the military, it was now, like, he, he didn't force us to do the military. We did it because we wanted to. We wanted to serve our country. We didn't do it for the school. We didn't do it for the, definitely didn't do it for the money. We did it because that was our calling. I wanted to serve my country, be it good, bad, or whatever situation we were in, deployed, you know, it just, for me, it was all about pride in serving my country. It's, uh, it's only a matter of time before Marco's kids and my kids you know, they, they start asking questions, you know, and we start explaining to them who our father was and who his mother was and, and why we served, you know, or why we're serving. And it's, it, it's just like it did to us, something's going to light up, man, and that fire ain't going to go out. Okay, these are kind of crazy. Mm. I love these. These, at first glance, just look like some really cool high heels. Yeah. This, um, and this go, it's the ankle aspect of it. Oh, you look like you've done this before. <laughs> bullets, like, all around. It's crazy, bullets. Crazy, but fake, right? There is a weapon, because it has a gun as a base of the heel. Mm -hmm. This can be used as a weapon, even though, you know, you can hit somebody here with that. Oh, look at the heel. Oh, God. Fashion statement. What size are these? <laughs> New Horizons spots its next flyby target 
Administrator Bridenstine visits our West Coast facilities and using data from space to fight a life-threatening disease. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. Our New Horizons spacecraft has made its first detection of the Kuiper Belt object it is scheduled to fly by on New Year's Day 2019. The small, dim object, nicknamed Ultima Thule, was detected by the spacecraft's telescopic long-range reconnaissance imager from a distance of more than 100 million miles. The flyby will be the first ever close-up exploration of a small Kuiper Belt object and the farthest exploration of any planetary body in history, shattering the record New Horizons itself set at Pluto in July 2015 by about 1 billion miles. The Kuiper Belt is a ring of icy objects around the Sun that extends just beyond the orbit of Neptune and includes Pluto. On August 27th, our administrator Jim Bridenstine kicked off a series of visits to our West Coast centers and facilities with a stop at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. While there, he visited labs and test beds related to the InSight Mars lander, the Mars 2020 rover, and the Mars helicopter. The next day at our Armstrong Flight Research Center in Edwards, California, Bridenstine heard about a number of aeronautical research projects and visited Mojave Air and Spaceport. The administrator's final stop was Ames Research Center in Northern California. While there, he talked to the Ames workforce and saw innovative thermal protection materials being developed to support the agency's space exploration missions. He also spoke to the NASA Advisory Council about our plans to return humans to the lunar surface. This time when we go to the moon, we're going sustainably. In other words, we're not gonna do flags and footprints again. And this time when we go, we're gonna go to stay. For the first time ever, measurements from our Earth observing research satellites are being used to help combat a potential outbreak of the life-threatening disease cholera. A humanitarian effort in Yemen is targeting areas identified by a NASA-supported project that precisely forecasts high-risk regions for the disease based on environmental conditions observed from space. The forecasts are made using data from our Global Precipitation Measurement Mission and our Terra and Aqua satellites, as well as measurements of phytoplankton concentrations in nearby coastal ocean areas. Our ISAT-2 mission will use the most advanced laser instrument of its kind to measure in unprecedented detail changes in the heights of Earth's polar ice. The mission's Advanced Topographic Laser Altimeter System, or ATLAS, will fire 10,000 times each second, sending hundreds of trillions of photons to the ground in six beams of green light. ATLAS measures the height of objects by timing how long it takes individual light photons to travel from the spacecraft to Earth and back. ICESat-2 is scheduled to launch September 15th from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov. Behind me stands the only operational cryogenics facility in the Air Force. Ran by the 18th Logistics Readiness Squadron on Kadena Air Base, its mission to synthesize and provide liquid nitrogen and oxygen to organizations throughout the Pacific. We manufacture liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen for various organizations to use for breathable oxygen at high altitudes for aircraft. Also, they use liquid nitrogen uh, to fill tires for the aircraft so they don't explode if they hit the ground too hard. Also, the hospital has various uses for oxygen, as you can imagine. The process of producing and distributing these elements, Talon says, could save the taxpayers millions. I'm confident it would pay for itself. You know, we can sell liquid oxygen to organizations on base for, for $2 a gallon, whereas we would buy it off base for $10 a gallon. It's, it's a real immediate return. Staff Sergeant Daniel Fernandez, Kadena Air Base, Japan.